God a good God? I mean, after all, if God was really a good God, would he let things like this happen to one of his people? I mean, does a good God really do that? And, and I think the goodness question really comes into play as we think about this God that we read about and we discover in the Old Testament, this Old Testament version of God, because we're not sure sometimes, even as we actually read and engage the Bible, that that, that guy from that first sort of half to two-thirds of the book is, is really all that good. Now, remember last week I told you, if you were here or you tuned in, that context and culture matter? Like, this is really, really, really important. Well, one of my favorite living Bible scholars, there's two or three that I just sort of love. One of my favorites, his name is Pete Enns. And he wrote a book that was released back in 2019. I actually got to be a part of the book launch team, so I got to read a pre-release copy of this book. And he wrote a book entitled, How the Bible Actually Works. And that might seem strange to you, but I think a lot of times we approach this book with different like thoughts, like, ooh, the Bible does this, or it, it offers this. And, and when we have these thoughts and expectations about our Bible, but the Bible never intends to sort of be those things or answer those things, sometimes we, we run into problems. And he, and he makes a few points. He says, one, the Bible is an ancient book. So, like, for example, if we just go back from where we are to King David, that was about 3,000 years ago. Now, if we would take a conversation that any of us might have with today's, uh, you know, terms, with our, uh, you know, figures of speech, with the idioms that we use, right? And we were to go forward to the year 5,000, which is about the same gap. Do you think a conversation that you and I were to have today would be completely understandable and graspable by someone 3,000 years from now? No. Maybe not, right? And so we need to understand when we read this book, it's an ancient book. It's also a, a, an ambiguous book, right? So like we're, we're told commands like, hey, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. And in the Old Testament in particular, there was all kinds of things around that, like you couldn't even leave your home on the Sabbath. But if you needed to leave your home or there was something that was sort of kind of important, you could actually take a possession and take it like a quarter mile down the road and another thing. And as long as you had a piece of property that belonged to you every quarter mile or so, that technically meant you didn't leave home. It was a loophole where you could totally break what the Bible said and still sort of be good. Crazy, right? Or what about Jesus who, who basically says, hey, you know, if like your animal's stuck in a ditch on the Sabbath, obviously you need to go tend to that urgent matter on this day. So even Jesus messes that up. Or, or, or take like something we would think would be simple, like, hey, what does the Bible say is one of the most important things for us to love God and love others? We're supposed to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. But how do we do that? Like, what are the specifics? What does that look like? How should we treat our neighbor? What if, what if we have a hard time loving ourselves for any number of reasons? Then what does that look like, right? So even the things that seem simple can be a little bit complicated and ambiguous sometimes, right? And, and then the other thing he says is that the Bible is a diverse book. The, the Bible was written by approximately 40 writers over somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500 years. Do you think they had different thoughts and perspectives that there was going to be things that wouldn't perfectly jive? Absolutely. Now, let me, can I say something potentially even more troubling? <laughs> you, you, you guys, many of you are like, it doesn't matter what we say, you're going to say it anyway, so just go ahead, right? Bible scholars actually largely agree that the conquest of Canaan that's found in Joshua 6 through 12 did not actually happen as the Bible records it. <gasps> right? Why? Well, th because the archaeological evidence doesn't at all even come close to supporting what the Bible says happens. So you can dig and dig and dig and dig, and if something at that level had taken place, there would be all kinds of signs and clues, and we find literally none of those, 
right? So, so, so what's going on here? Is this a problem? Rob, are you trying to undermine the Bible? Are you saying that it's not true or reliable? I'm not saying that at all. I, I'm just saying a lot of times we come to the Bible with expectations the Bible itself does not have of the Bible. Maybe what we read is exactly how you would communicate as an ancient tribalistic culture about your mighty warrior God who always gives you the victory. Does that make sense? You might not even agree, but does it make sense at least? Right? So don't come to the Bible and try to read it as this perfect, neat, it's always going to work out spiritual guidebook that if you just cross every T and dot every I, everything will come into focus for you. One of the things Pete N. says that I love, he says, don't always read the Bible literally, read it literarily. And what he means is, when you're reading something that's poetry, read it as a poem. When you're reading something that's a letter, read it as a letter with a specific person that, or a group of people that are being written to. Don't just read it as, I'm going to take this verse and, and think about what I think about when I read that verse. We have to understand this book in context this is true in the old testament it's true in the new testament so remember we got a couple verses that are our series verses here that set the foundation for us the first one a famous one from hebrews 13 that tells us this jesus christ is the same yesterday today and forever so from the vantage point of the new testament jesus who is fully god does not change. He is the same in the past as he is in the present as he will be in the future. Hmm, okay, Rob, that sounds good, but that's Jesus, and that's New Testament. Even I get what you said, but that's still Jesus. What about this Old Testament God then? Well, Malachi 3.6, God tells us this, right? I, the Lord, do not change. I, I, I don't change. And so, does God change? Has God changed? No. You guys are kind of going down. It should be going up. Will God ever change? No. Much better. So he is the same in the Old Testament and in the New Testament and in the entire Bible. It's the same God. Okay, okay, Rob, he, he's the same. We hear that. But which one? Is, is he the same mean God? that that a lot of people sort of hear and feel and think about when they read the Old Testament, or is he the same nice God? Because remember, this series, right, we're talking about the stairway to heaven and the highway to hell. And so if, if it's the mean God who's always sort of like watching out to get us, right? And maybe he, we got to watch over our shoulder because you never know if God, he's a little bit hungry or a little bit moody or whatever, right? Like if that's our God and he's trying to sort of punish us and push us over here, it'd be good to know that, wouldn't it? And at the same time, if God is just so loving that no matter what we do and no matter how we live, he's got us and we're good, it would be good to know that too, wouldn't it? And so check this out again. I showed you this last week. It's just too good not to see again. The fact that there is a highway to hell and only a stairway to heaven says a lot about anticipated traffic patterns. So are we dealing with a God who gets really excited about punishment, right? Like, oh, <laughs> Do you see what Andy Cusick is getting ready to do? I will smite him, right? Like, is that our God? Or do we serve a God who gets really excited about forgiveness and, and looks, looks at us as his kids and says, oh man, I know they, they messed that up bad and I, I, I know they, they feel terrible, um, but I love them and I believe in them and I am for them and I forgive them. And, and we should be concerned about these questions, church, because if we discover that this Old Testament God, we're going to think about the Old Testament God today, if this Old Testament God is, is kind of bad and kind of mean because, you know, he's the same God in the Old Testament and the New Testament, if we discover these things in the Old Testament, it may totally mess up our view of the the nice guy in the New Testament too, right? 
So it's kind of dangerous. We should probably just ignore the Old Testament God and only focus on the nice New Testament guy, right? Well, no, let's see what the Old Testament has to tell us about our God. And this is really, really important. Now, let me give you the whole other extreme. And a lot of people believe this and embrace this. Uh, British evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins, in his book, The God Delusion, describes the God of the Old Testament this way. Listen to these words. He says, The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. So, you know, the most, and then fiction, you hear that, right? Because he's not real, because this is just the God delusion. Here's how he continues. Uh, He's jealous and proud of it. He's a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, uh, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniac, sadomasochistic, uh, capriciously malevolent bully. So obviously Dawkins does not believe in and is not a big fan of God. Who he does again, he's uh, who doesn't exist, but he spends this much time, energy, and effort thinking about and writing about this God. But here's the, the question we really have to wrestle with. Even if God is real, is, is he right in his analysis of who God is, or at least who God seems to be in the Old Testament? Is this true rob i I get what you're saying about the old testament you know how it was written and who it was written to but rob i'm not sure that you just saying those things is enough to convince me that what i read in the pages of this book uh, are something other than what i perceive and i perceive that the old testament god is different than the new testament god he is way less kind and all those things and so as, as we seek to answer this question today, we have to think about the entire arc of the Bible. You know, what, what's going on uh, in, the, in this book? And I just want to stop in at three places quickly uh, for the next few minutes, three key stops, if you will. The first one is foundational, right? It's going to set a foundation for us about who God is and who God has always been. The second stop deals with the bad stuff that we see in the Old Testament. So we're going to drop into like one of the worst things that we see that we really got to wrestle with if we want to sort of tell people and even ourselves believe that our God is a good God. And then the third one deals with like how good God is and really the central thing that happens in the Old Testament. But before we we drop into those few spots, would would you just pray with me? So, Lord, today, as we just spend a few more minutes before landing this plane, I, I just have one request. No matter who you are, if you're this benevolent, all loving uh, being in the sky, or if, if you're just angry and, and out to correct everything and everyone and to blow us all up, I, I just pray, God, today we would see very clearly who you are. We ask these things together in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so here's stop number one. This is the foundational stop. And uh, we're going to go all the way back. I sort of joked last week, Pastor Bud you know, went all the way back to Genesis, and I only went to Exodus last week, so we sort of had a little joke there. Uh, but um, uh, we're going to go all the way back to the very beginning, the very first verse in the Bible. It says this, in the beginning, God, what did he do? Created. He created the heavens and the earth. In the very beginning, we discover a God who's creative, uh, and he's the only one who can and did create the Hebrew term in the Old Testament when God created was ek nihilo, which means out of nothing, right? Everything you make, everything I make, we make it out of something, right? You could be a woodworker, you need some wood and some tools in order to make that magic happen, right? So you take something that exists 
and you alter it, you, you, you change it a little bit, and you create something new. God took nothing and created everything. How cool is this, right? And, and remember, after God created, on every day of creation, when he created, what did he say every single time about his creation? It was what? It was good, right? It was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. And at the end, when he looked over everything that had been made out of nothing by him, he actually concluded it was not just good, but very good, right? So this term, good, actually means perfect according to design. So there were no design flaws. God didn't mess anything up in the process. And there were no manufacturing errors as well. Okay? And so here's what I want us to see here foundationally. From the very beginning, God was in the habit of making good things. Do you see that? Now, this was true in the beginning, and it's true now. This was is true of you. And it's true of me. God doesn't ever make junk. Like, never. It never, ever happens. We are all perfect according to our design. And that design is always good. It's it's never anything other than good. Now, the next stop is the bad stop. And again, this is one of the most uh, difficult parts of the Old Testament that we've got to deal with if we want to conclude that God is good. So I want us to think just for a minute about the flood, right? Where God makes the decision because the inclination of every human heart was only evil all the time. God chooses to to let the waters rise, to flood the earth. No one's willing to turn to God. No one's willing to even like listen uh, to Noah. None of that stuff. And so the entire world, minus two of every animal and one extended family, is literally wiped off the face of the earth. How in the world could a good God ever do something like this? Well, I want us to drop in to a, a, a conversation. God's, God's sort of speaking here. And this is after the flood. Listen to these words from Genesis chapter 9. Then God told Noah and his sons, I hereby confirm my covenant with you and your descendants and with all the animals that were on the boat with you, the birds, the livestock, and all of the wild animals, every living creature on earth. Yes, I am confirming my covenant with you. Never again will the flood waters kill all living creatures. Never again will a flood destroy the earth. Then God said, I am giving you a sign of my covenant with you and with all living creatures for all generations to come. I have placed my rainbow in the clouds. It is the sign of my covenant with you uh, and with all the earth. When I send clouds over the earth, the rainbow will appear on the clouds, and I will remember my covenant with you and with all living creatures. Never again will the floodwaters destroy all life. When I see the rainbow in the clouds, I will remember the eternal covenant between God and every living creature on earth. Then God said to Noah, yes, this rainbow is the sign of the covenant I am confirming with all the creatures on the earth. Does it it seem like he said the exact same thing like four different times there, like over and over and over? Like this is so important. I just want you to hear it and get it. So, So think this with me. One of the worst Old Testament events. What is God doing? God is promising. He makes this promise to never, ever, ever do this again. So, so what do we see in the event of the flood? There's, there's some things that, that aren't necessarily all bad. One, we learn that there is consequences for our actions and for our lives. You see that? Like how you live and how I live matter. They're, they're, it's important. There's consequences, good and bad, for how we live. We also see here in this sort of broader story, and we, this is super important, as, as we see across the scope of the Bible, we learn that we mess it up 
and that God fixes our mess, or he at least offers to do that. The arc of the Bible is all about redemption. This is true from the very beginning to the very end. And what we have here is the first of the five major covenants we see God making uh, throughout the Bible. This is the Noahic covenant. Then we see the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the uh, Davidic covenant, and then the new covenant that Jesus establishes. And what is God doing here? Right? Because he, he's not saying, hey, as long as you guys never really mess things up, get off track. I mean, you don't have to read too much farther even in Genesis to start seeing God's people losing focus and not living for him anymore. What does God do? He's like, well, I said I wouldn't flood you, but I'm going to get you a different No, he doesn't do that, right? God is promising people that, that he won't do this ever again. So what is he doing here? He's taking more on himself even when we mess things up. What? Like, let me just ask you, if, if you were talking to someone and they like made you this offer, hey, listen, I, I know you've messed things up. You've gotten what you've rightly deserved as a consequence for your willful choices. That's how that works, right? We all know this, right? Uh, but God's like, hey, you know what? I don't like how that went. So I'm going to make you a promise. It's going to not just be a promise. It's going to be a covenant forever. Noah, not just with you and your family, but with every living creature that no matter what you do, no matter how you live, no matter how far you get from me, I will never, ever do this to you again. Crazy, right? Because sometimes we want to blow up people that we know and love because they're just not living up to what they need to live up to. Come on, amen? <laughs> Woo. Oh, so this sounds like a good deal, doesn't it? That God is promising that, that he will never do these horrible things that happen, rightly so, ever again. Now our last stop is, is the central event of the Old Testament, which is the Exodus. Um, and so listen to Exodus 13.3. I love this. So Moses said to the people, this is a day to remember forever. The day you left Egypt. Egypt, the place of your slavery, today the Lord has brought you out by the power of his mighty hand. And, and so what's going on in the Exodus? In the Exodus, God used any and all means possible to get his lowly people delivered from the global superpower of the day. This is what's happening in the Exodus. And isn't this weekend the perfect weekend to think about that and to think about that verse, right? Like, uh, as we think about veterans, remember this day forever. It, it's that important. But also, and I think that's what this text is trying to, to cue for us, also remember where true strength and true deliverance and true power come from. They don't come from the superpower. They come from God. We've got to remember this. Um, what do we see? How do we see this in the New Testament? Remember, remember the story of the guy who was uh, born blind, and what does Jesus do? He spits on the ground, and he makes some mud, and he just a super offensive thing, right? Like, ugh. But he puts this mud he makes on this guy's eyes. He tells him to go wash. And the guy says, hey, you know, who Jesus is, I do not know. All I know is this. I was blind, but now I see. Well, what do the people of God say in the Old Testament, this central act of deliverance? All I know is that I once was a slave, right, in bondage, making these bricks to build pyramids and buildings for the Egyptians. I was a slave, but now I am free. This is who God is. This is what God does, right? So if you 
feel like you are in bondage or in slavery, get with God because he wants to set you free. Here's the idea, that God consistently delivers and sets people free. So we have kids, church. We have teenagers. We have adults who are stuck. And they need to know our God who wants to deliver them and set them free. You know, too many prayers are being prayed and have been prayed for people who could have had some hope if only they had known God. You know, um, can can I give you guys a little peek, at least to January? Can I give you a little peek? Because cause this is something that, that just like is just has my heart beating faster, okay? So throughout history, every great move of God that, that we can sort of study has started with a small group of people who were, con- who were passionate and consistently praying. It wasn't a big thing usually. It was a small thing, but those people were committed and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And then at some point, God showed up and did what only God could do. Now, we live in a world where many people would say, oh my goodness, we need a move of God, a fresh move of God, now more than ever. Right? Anybody want God to move? Right? So listen, and here's crazy. So I I was talking to some people. Um, I was talking to uh, uh, some denominational leaders And they were telling me there's this organization that's trying to get people to pray and rally people to pray. And they said, uh, denominations, churches, everybody's reporting that fewer people are praying now than ever before. So here's the crazy thing. We know, we know historically over and over and over again that the thing that most likely incites a move of God is prayer. Right? Right? We all say, oh God, we want, we desperately need you to work and move. But we're not praying. If we really want God to work and move, wouldn't we do the things that cause him to work and move? I think we got to pray. We're actually, this is, this is the last sneak peek you get, uh, the last weekend of January, we're going to do 24 hours of prayer. You're going to have an opportunity to sign up for an hour slot. We're going to have different stations set up like the last number of times we've done that. And you, it doesn't matter if it's like two in the afternoon or two in the morning. You can come and you can be in this space and you can pray prayers and write prayers and, and pray. And, and for some of you who are hearing this and going, I could never do that. I'm not even going to think about signing up. Every single person in the past who said that and signed up said, I didn't think I could pray for an hour. I've never done that in my life. And they, they, they leave and they go, oh my goodness, the hour went so quickly. I need another hour. And if that happens to you, you can stay indefinitely. It's f- totally fine. Um, <clears throat> so because we need to pray, I want you to hear about these two things. We tell you this one every month. It's the second Sunday of the month. This afternoon at five o'clock is the Ukraine prayer time. If anybody wants to pray for the church in Ukraine and the people in Ukraine and just for war to stop and for the church to to rise up and man, Ukraine is such a strategic place in that whole region where it has access that we don't have to all these unreached people groups and countries all around there. If you want to pray for that, you can go to our website, newhope.rocks. There's like a picture in the in, uh, on the the, right there at the top, you can click on that. It will launch the Zoom meeting. It's 5 o'clock. We pray for an hour. You can just be on there. If, if you want to join, that would be awesome. I'd love to see you for that. Also, uh, this evening at 7 o'clock, we just got an email about this yesterday, um, but uh, a, a local kid, a ninth grader, shot himself on Friday. And, uh, and the last I heard, he was still in critical condition, um, I haven't had an update beyond that, so I'm not sure over the last half a day or so. Uh, But at the high school at 7 o'clock, just for a half hour, there's going to be just a a time of prayer. We're going to light candles and say a prayer. If anybody wants to come, you are invited to that. 
if we really want to see God work and move, we've got to do a little bit less, and we've got to pray a little bit more. Um, and you know, I don't, I don't pretend like that's going to solve every problem. Listen, God might not be the only step in a person's process toward health, but man, he is such a key step that I would not want to miss. All right, so question for you. What do you think of this kind of Old Testament God? From beginning to end, he, he's creative. He made everyone, and he only makes things that are good. Do you like that, Old Testament God? Two of you nodded. Okay. I, I don't know how to take that. Uh, how about this? From the first book of the Bible, God is making covenants. He's cleaning up our messes. He's bringing redemption, and he's limiting his own righteous consequences. Do you like that, God? A few more of you like that one? Let me do one more. From the first day to the last day, God is liberating people who come to him. There is this constant movement from slavery to freedom for those who do life with God. Do you like that? God. Amen. Amen. So I just want to ask you, I know sometimes we do everybody here and looking up, because listen, we've been talking all year about living lives as better disciples, as better followers of Jesus, right? And so uh, almost 11 months in, you know, to this year, it doesn't make sense for, oh yeah, I'm going to, as long as no one else is looking, I'll say that I'm going to, no, 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 no. If we're going to really follow Jesus, it's time to be a little bit more bold, right? Four of you are on board. That's good. Uh, so let me just ask these things, th these beautiful things, a God who has made you and he's made you to be good and it's not messed up. And yeah, you might have gotten a little dirty and you might have gotten a little off path, but God made you good and he wants to, to redeem you and put you back on that path. A, a God who wants to covenant with you to say, hey, listen, some stuff had to happen in the past, but you know what? I love you, and I'm for you, and I'm trying to clean up your mess and, and do something in you that causes you to be a part of something greater. And you know what? I see how you're stuck and trapped. You're in bondage. You're a slave to this thing or to that thing. And God looks at us and says, I want to set you free. And so I just wonder, is there anyone here who says, I need some of that in my life? I don't care which one it is. I need some of that. I want some of that. I want this kind of experience with God. Amen. I, I do. I do double time. <laughs> and so Jesus, here we are, are fully exposed before you, but we know this is always the case. It's always the case. You, you know everything. You see everything. God, you, you can even see the, the thoughts and intentions in our minds and in our hearts. And yet, you say we are good. You tell us that you are for us. You are setting us free. So God, we, we just receive your goodness. Your goodness isn't just, it doesn't show up after the, the 400 years of silence when we get to the New Testament and Jesus finally shows up. We see it all through the beginning of the book. When we, when we see the book all together, your goodness is everywhere. And so God, I just pray that you would meet us right where we are. God, that you would, you would in some instances, pull us from the highway and help us to the stairway. God, may our lives be different because of what you have done and what you are doing in us and through us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.